Okay, welcome everybody uh, to our virtual Discover Speaker Series in Sectopia. My name is Reagan. I'm the program coordinator with the Puget Sound Estuarium here in Olympia, Washington. Um, we're really excited today to have both James McEller and Max Adams with us. Um, we're going to do something pretty interesting. We're going to actually show a little film, a short film that James made a few years ago that highlights insects. And then Max is going to talk a little bit more about research that he's done to understand the relationship between urban environments and our insects. So I just want to give a little bit of background to how this concept came about. Um, last fall, the Estuarium was hosting a, an exhibit series called On Invertebrates. Um, during that, I was poking around on the internet looking for things that we could do for the public to teach them more about our amazing invertebrates that we have here in Puget Sound. And I came across James's film. Um, there's a shocking limit to how many films there are out there on insects, <laughs> besides arachnophobia, which of course most people know about. Um, so I was really excited to see something that kind of highlighted how cool they are and, and just really showed them in a different light. Um, so I reached out to him on Facebook, kind of cold dropped an instant message to him asking if he was the filmmaker. I wasn't even sure if he was the right one. And then about six months later, um, he messaged me back and said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, so we've um, been talking to him about being able to show this film at some point. And when we um, started to have issues with coronavirus, we decided to start up our virtual Discover Speaker series. So I reached out to him again, said, hey, we're thinking about doing this. How do you feel? And so he said, yeah, let's do it. Um, and then through more internet surfing, um, I found Max Adams and a research project project that he did, a paper that he did a little while ago about the relationship between insects and the urban environment. So I was really excited to kind of um, marry uh, art and science to help us learn a little bit more. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to show the film. I'm going to share my screen so you guys can see it. Um, just so you know, Zoom isn't always the best. So we're going to also include a link to the video. Um, if you're on Zoom, it's in the chat box. If you're on Facebook, it's included on the post for Facebook. Um, so you can watch it as you want. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then we'll talk a little bit more with James about working with insects and kind of why he made this type of film. All right, so give me one second here while we get things set up. And we'll get started. Okay. All right, here we go. And there is a 10 second blackout at the beginning. Don't worry, it will get started here in just a minute.
Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, well, we hope that you guys enjoyed that film. It looks like Zoom was not projecting the sound like we had thought it would, unfortunately. Um, I do apologize for that, but like I said, we included the link to the video, so please watch it um, so you can hear the sound as well. Um, the sound mixing is also very good on this. Um, so we're going to talk to James for a little bit. Stop sharing my screen. And then um, I know I have some questions. If you guys do have questions for James, we're going to do a Q&A at the very end um, with both Max and James. So first question, James, is why did you pick insects <laughs> when most <laughs> people think they're girls are creepy? <laughs> Yeah, that was um, that, that was almost one of the reasons. Um, at, at the time I was making that, I'd always wanted to uh, to make a film using miniature sets um, and special effects. It was really a big experiment into doing special effects. Um, and the most obvious thing to me was what would look great in a miniature set. Huge insects would look great. That was it was it was it was really just that was the the, the core of the idea. And um, I went to to pitch it um, at the the funding organization and um and when they said yes i i um i suddenly had a bit of a panic attack i'm, I'm actually pretty scared of those insects myself um <laughs> i've never done anything like it before <laughs> so it was yeah quite crazy that's awesome so when you were coming up with the concept for the film and they gave you the green light to go ahead and do it how did you get access to that variety of um, arthropods. So there are just a uh, side note, they're not all insects in that little group. We also have some arachnids and some millipedes, which are technically in a different group. Um, but for the sake of this talk, we're just gonna kind of consider the insects. Um, so how did you get access to them? Um, so yeah, uh, a friend of a friend, um, there's a chap called Guy Tansley, who, who was a re research scientist at Newcastle University. Um, and I, I was just talking uh, actually to a friend about how I was going to source all the insects. And uh, as it happens, um, what, what Guy does in his spare time is, is take lots of uh, insects um, round to, to, to different um, uh, school parties and museums to try and get people who are afraid of, of insects to not be afraid of them anymore. So um, it, it, it took, it took nearly, nearly a year to source all of the insects and to get them in. We, we actually had to breed some of them and things like that, but that was fine because um, the, the set took that long to build as well. So it was, it was yeah, it was quite a complex task. Yeah, and then, um, so you had to build the sets yourself. How big was the set overall that you had to build? Um, it, was, it was about 40 foot long. Um, wow. Yeah, so it was, it, was, it was quite large. You don't see all of it in the film. Actually, we we, um, we actually went out to make a film which was which was a lot bigger. It was feature film length, um, and this is we were only funded for the short. <laughs> so there's actually there's there's only um, you're actually only watching about ten percent of, of the film there. Oh wow! Um, the rest is so expensive to compile. It's sitting on a shelf <laughs> at the moment. Oh. But yeah, there's a lot of different scenes. A lot of different habitats in there and sort of cherry pick the best. So if you um, got the funding or the opportunity, would you make that feature film? I'm not sure I would now. <laughs> um, yeah, the, 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 the filming took seven months to get that. And there, there was a lot of other bits and bobs, but most of it was, was sitting in the set, which we were paying for day by day, um, waiting for something to happen. You know, I did treat right. it like natural history, where you 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 put the, the creatures in there and then watch and wait and see what happens. And obviously, we, we don't have some idea of the the behaviours they would exhibit um, by putting you know more males or females in, in, in the mix. But um, it was it was really a case of you know you know insects are really they'd be quite boring. They sit there for days and not do a thing, especially when you you're rolling camera, you know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you had one, one of the insects or, you know, any of the arthropods that you're working with, which one would you work with again? Oh, you know, the, the mantids were brilliant. Um, uh, the, 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 the main character, Woody, as we call him, because we think he looks like Woody Allen. Um, uh, there's actually four of Woody. Um, two Woodies died <laughs> in the making of. Um, and uh, after that, me and Mike, we kept... Uh, 
uh, we, we kept our mantises for a while and bred them and you know, just ha had them for, for good. So Woody went on to breed whole families of, <laughs> of, of insects. It was great. <laughs> good for Woody. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, it's a really great film and it's a really cool concept. And um, being able to see them up close like that with the cinematography that you did is, is really unique. And I can't imagine how long you had to sit there and wait for them to do something exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually, that's, that's a good question. So how long was your filming? How long did you spend filming all of this? Uh, so the, the filming itself was seven months. Um, oh, wow. And I'd, I'd go in most mornings or um, evenings on occasion um, while while working job. I, you know, I'm, I'm a cameraman, uh, it's my day job. So it was, it was fitting it in all around that. Um, and then the, the editing process took another three or four months um, to follow oh, wow. that down. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was quite a process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. Well, filmmaking is, you know, kind of a big process on its own, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for, for joining us, and I really hope everybody gets an opportunity to watch the film again with the sound. I do apologize for that. Every once in a while, Zoom does something that we are not expecting, and that was one of them, uh, but uh, the sound editing is really great too, and I, I was going to ask, so you, did you do all the sound editing as well with um, background noises from the other insects and everything? Yeah, so we actually didn't, we didn't record sound at all while making the film, so everything you hear there is, is Foley work, it's all, it's all sound effects. Um, a lovely chap called Andy Lugbrook um, went out and created most of it, um, it you know, simply by, you know, uh, crink, crinkling up paper and, and all sorts of things, but the the uh, the, the beetles were, were that was an alligator roar. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, <laughs> <It was blurry. laughs> yeah, to put a scale up the up. sound. Yeah. yeah, I did notice um, with the mantis. So um, you know, they pull air in through um, their um, I want to, abdomen. Almost said thorax, max, and that was wrong. Abdomen, and you can see it moving. And I caught that you guys um, actually put in breathing sounds at that part, where you can see yeah. their abdomen is breathing. It's really cool. Uh, okay. I, I think yeah, Andy was huffing into a paper bag to, to achieve that. Yeah. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, for this like, good time, um, we're going to move on and we're going to learn a little bit more science to today's talk with Max. So Max, go ahead and get yourself set up, and then we'll get started with that. All right, I'll go ahead and unmute. You can hear me, right? Yep, sounds good. All right, great. Well, I'm going to share screen. Um, it looks like it's disabling that right now with the new setup. Oh, is it? Okay, hold on one yeah. second. There you go. All right, fantastic. Let's see if I can. Yep. And we'll share. Can everyone see that? All good to go? Yeah, looks good. All right, fantastic. So um, um, James, thanks a lot for uh, letting us watch your film. It's really enjoyable. Uh, I, uh, I do a lot of insect behavior work, so I can completely relate to the amount of time you have to take to actually like catch these behaviors in action. And getting them on film, I can't even begin to imagine. Um, so I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm an insect ecologist. Uh, I am currently based at the, uh, at George Washington University in Washington, DC. Um, prior to this, I was at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, uh, which is where some of the work that I'm going to be talking about today is from. Uh, but I am, I'm someone who's fascinated in insects. So I guess I'm, I'm coming at this from the other side as James, not someone who's, who is, uh, learning to love insects. I've been fiddling around with them for a long time. Um, yeah, so why study insects? Um, I, so I, I mentioned early on, I'm an insect ecologist. Uh, for those of you who may not immediately be uh, familiar with the term, ecology is the study of the distribution of species in space and time, uh, which is a fancy way to say I study uh, insects specifically to ask these two questions. Let's see if it will, uh, we may have some issues with the sharing screen and moving things forward. Let's see if I can do that. There we go. All right. And so the two questions I ask are what lives here 
And why does it live here? Uh, this is really the heart of, insect, oh, of ecology as a, as a science. Uh, we're a group of bio biologists who are really interested in where things live. So I often like to uh, equate us to essentially professional kindergartners. We're people who spend a lot of time flipping over rocks and asking the same sort of questions small kids would ask, well, well what is this? And, and why is it here? And if I flip over the next rock, is it, is it there too? And I do this type of question, I ask it at multiple scales, whether it be at the scale of rocks or maybe at the scale of individual trees or whole yards, uh, sometimes whole cities and whole forests. Uh, I've been doing this for several years. Uh, I got my start working on insect in coastal uh, marshes, specifically looking at how insects survive hurricanes and uh, oil spills. I spent a number of years working in the tropics, studying ants and other insects that live at the top of the rainforest canopy. And for the last couple of years, um, up until the end of last year, I was actually working in LA studying insects that live in people's yards. Um, this is a bit of a divergence, but I hope that through all this, you'll see how all these kind of things come together. And actually studying insects in people's yards has been one of the more fascinating um, aspects of my work. So often people immediately ask me, why, why, why study insects? Um, I, I generally don't want them in my yard. I generally don't want them in my house. Uh, but as someone who's really interested in where things live and why they live there, uh, it's really a, a great idea to look at, at things that are super, super diverse. And I think this next picture really captures why insects are important. So this is what's called a speciescape. So each of the organisms you see here, whether it be the tree or the frog or the, the tiny, tiny little caribou, uh, they're all scaled based on the number of species we know exist on the planet, the number of different types. And the, the elephant in the room should be that obvious gigantic fly in the corner. Um, the fly uh, represents all this insect species that we've described so far, which is about a million different species. This represents about half of all known species on the planet. So if you're someone like me, who's really interested in where things live and why things are distributed in different ways and how they interact and what that does uh, in the formation of ecosystems, it's, it's really helpful to study the things that are really prominent. Um, but I, I would be remiss not to say that this is something that I, I've come to uh, accidentally. Uh, this is actually a picture I drew when I was about five or six. Uh, my mom sent it to me when I was wrapping up my PhD to hand out to my advisors to tell them, please don't, don't fail me. Uh, yeah, so these are two ants uh, performing what I now know is called trophallaxis. They're feeding each other. The, the one on the left is clearly the queen. She's got a big distended abdomen. She's got some eggs under her. So, so I've been doing this kind of stuff since since as long as I can remember. Um, generally pictures of me are me flipping over stones or sticks, me digging in things, and me generally poking around people's backyards. Uh, so the, the, the idea of being a professional kindergartner is something that makes a lot of sense to me. And it, it makes a lot of sense to most ecologists. We, we are really people who are interested in the little things or just, or the big things that are, that are interacting around you. We're people who study ecosystems. Uh, the specific ecosystem though I want to talk to you all about is, is the urban ecosystem and specifically a, a project that I've been a part of uh, through the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles called BioScan, which stands for Biodiversity, Science, City and Nature. And what BioScan is hoping to do is to both discover new species that exist right alongside of us here in any urban environment and to figure out why those species live where they live. Uh, I work with a group of taxonomists and systemicists, they're the people who identify new species. And then I'm the ecologist who goes, well, why are these here? So we've been doing this in LA and cities like LA are really, really fantastic environments to study why things live where they live. Uh, you can get these really stunning um, differences within a city. You can have something like this, Griffith Park, this very natural landscape immediately adjacent to downtown LA, a, a very, a very um, urbanized, industrialized uh, zone. Cities also provide us lots of opportunities to study insects in a lot of more, less natural environments. They have to compete with city lights, cars, and whatnot. And cities also present a lot of three-dimensional structure, which is just not very typical in most natural environments. And so this opens the door to a lot of questions about different habitats, about well, how does an insect respond to this, and how does it respond to that, and what, de what determines where insects live, especially um, as we develop more and more cities, this becomes a, a bigger question because insects provide a lot of what we call ecosystem services. These are things that, that they do like pollination or breaking down detritus. These are, these are services insects provide for us for free. So understanding why they live where they live is 
pretty quintessential to making more sustainable and hopefully uh, more environmentally fr friendly cities. Um, on top of it, cities are full of a diverse group of insects. This is the first picture I had up when I, I started this up. And all of these insects you see here are all things we collected in people's backyards in Los Angeles. So even in the middle of one of the largest urban centers in, centers in North America, there's really just an incredible diversity of insects. So how do we do this? What we do is we team up with a bunch of people from across the, uh, the larger metropolitan area and we put one of these things in their backyard. This is called a malaise trap. It's essentially a passive insect collection device. Insects will run into the bottom part of it. It kind of looks like a tent. It then funnels them up into the top and they end up in a vial that we're able to collect from. So uh, we've actually distributed these tents, these little malaise traps, about 100 of them all over Los Angeles and have been collecting insects since I think the project launched in about 2012. Um, if you're familiar with Los Angeles, uh, this kind of cluster of dots in the middle is pretty much the, the urban core of LA, right there to the left of it. I'm not sure if my, if my mouse shows up, if you can see it, the Hollywood sign's about here. So to give you some frame of reference, uh, Santa Monica and the really famous beach are down here. Uh, but yeah, so this is LA, this covers a couple hundred miles uh, in east to west and north to south. And we've been putting these, these tents up all over the place to see what determines the diversity and the distribution of insects across this major urban environment. And one of the fun things about this and about working in people's yards is you realize just how much diversity of like habitat a yard can have. A lot of yards look something like this. Maybe, maybe this looks kind of akin to your backyard. Uh, a turf lawn, ornamental plants. In LA, it's often lots of citrus trees. Um, however, we also get yards like this in LA. Uh, which is what I would think of as like a really native habitat to that environment. It's dry, it's got all these xeric kind of deserty plants, and then sometimes we end up in backyards that probably look more like the natural environment in Olympia, uh, these, these relative jungles in the middle of the city. And so we're able to look at not only what happens to insects across this large urban gradient, but also what happens if we shift a little bit of difference between yards. So what happens so what is the impact of urbanization as a whole? And what happens at the, the scale that you can actually control? What happens if you change your landscaping? And to kind of study insects, there's, as I mentioned, there's a ton of them. We've actually been focusing on three major groups. Uh, we've been focusing on butterflies and bees as two of our groups. And the top line that you see there are actually all flies. Uh, Dr. Brian Brown, who's the head curator of entomology, at uh, the Natural History Museum of LA is a fly expert. And so we do do a lot of work on flies. I know most people probably are going, oh, why, why flies? Uh, flies actually perform a ton of ecosystem services. Um, they are pollinators, they are detritivores, they basically anything an insect does, flies do. So even though we may not be immediately thrilled about the idea of like studying more flies, this is actually a really great group to study if you're interested in, in what can insects do for us. Uh, so as I mentioned, we've been partnering up with lots and lots of people all across LA, putting these traps in their yards. And this is a really fantastic opportunity to also just meet and talk with people. It also gives us a chance to then take these insects back to the lab, work with undergraduates, teach them about how science works, how insect uh, ecology and entomology works, and they sort out our insects. Those things all then go out to a exhibit and we're able to talk to people one-on-one -on -one about insects in their backyards. So not only is this like a, a research project or we're studying what's happening in yards, but this is a, uh, a large scale opportunity for us to, to talk to people, to talk to people about science. So this has a, a, been a really fun project to be a part of. And so from this project, we've actually had a lot of, of really cool discoveries. One of the first things we have, we, I wanna talk about is we've actually discovered 47 new species of flies that are known to exist nowhere else in the world except for in Los Angeles. So. Even the largest, one of the largest urban cities in the US, poking around a little bit and just setting up traps in people's yards, we've discovered things that were unknown to science beforehand. And all those people who've let us put traps in their yard, they each have a fly now named after them. So one of the advantages of working with scientists is every once in a while, you may get something interesting named after you. So each one of these flies is, is named after some of our, um, our site hosts. So on top of that, for this, this is the thing that really gets our, our taxonomists and systemicists really excited is all these new discoveries. For me, I'm really excited about like, well, why are they there? And we found some pretty cool things. So if you look across 
an urban, this large urban landscape. There's this, um, this bit of this gradient is what we would call it, where you're going from more natural areas up in the foothills down to these very, the very urban core of LA. Unfortunately, one of the things we discovered is that as you move from those more natural areas into the urban core, you tend to lose a lot of your native species. And that's, that's not something we wanna find out because that means that you're losing these really important species that are providing lots of ecosystem services that are natural in the environment. They may be rare um, and they're often replaced by species that are what we would call um, urban specialists and often invasive species that are coming from other areas. Uh, it was a really unfortunate finding. We were like, oh, that's, that's not ideal, but uh, that, that happens. Um, but one of the more interesting things we found is that even though this large gradient, you see this sort of loss of diversity. If you look at what people are doing at their individual yard, uh, you can actually override that urban gradient. We found that people who planted their yard with native and drought tolerant plants in the case of LA actually tended to basically reinvigorate the biodiversity. You would get an increase in the number of native species and you'd see a more diverse insect community. So you'd see more different types of insects. Um, and this was, this is fantastic. This immediately means that at least in LA at the scale of an individual yard, at the scale that you and I can potentially uh, function at and like actually have some control over, you can actually contribute to diversity of insects across a, across a, a large urban area, even if uh, you would have normally lived in a, an insect poor area. Now, there may be a lot of people who are going, well, why would I want more insects in my yard? Um, if you're interested in birds, if you're interested in flowers, if you're interested in growing fruit, insects are not only one of the bases of our food chains, they're also our pollinators. And um, actually, the things we found that really started to respond to the native plants were native pollinators. So if you're really interested in protecting bees, planting native at the scale of your yard, at, if, you, if you can control your green space, is a super, super positive, has super positive effects on bees. It also has positive effects on some of our other important pollinators like this flower fly. Uh, and again, I will probably show more pictures of flies than I will show of bees. This is actually another flower fly here. Um, when you work with fly people, this is the, the focus you get. So yeah, so cities are really diverse habitats. And unfortunately, our, our, the processes we, we go about to basically urbanize an area do, does have negative effects on insect diversity. However, you can at the individual scale, at your, the scale of your yard, positively affect it. Uh, as a scientist, it's really interesting to study cities for a number of reasons. First, uh, greater than 50% of people now live in these urban settings. And for me, if I want my science to be impactful and meaningful and maybe be something we can have a conversation about, it's, it's important to do science where other people live. Additionally, because there's so many people moving into it, this is one of the fastest growing environments on the planet. As, a, as an ecologist, I'm interested in how ecosystems function and what, what causes them to be out of balance. Um, and so studying one of the fastest growing environments is probably uh, a really ideal place to ask interesting scientific questions and also in, hopefully impactful scientific questions. So what can you do? The first thing I would suggest you do is if, if you have control over your green space, whether it be a yard or a balcony, or maybe you're part of a, a larger homeowners association, plant native plants. This is one of the best things we found in the work I've done and work other people have done on the East Coast. Uh, planting native plants has positive uh, impacts on insect diversity, bird diversity, reptiles, and amphibians. Additionally, can cultivate diverse habitats. Um, so those, those native yards often had an area with water and some sort of feature that would be positive for birds. Uh, they often had areas that were very dry. They would have areas that had mulch. These sort of multiple habitat approaches are really positive for insects. And lastly, if you, if you ever have the chance, if you find out that local researchers are doing work in urban places, volunteer your yards. This is one of the, the biggest impediments to us doing our science is finding people who will let us put a trap in their yard for a year and wanna be a part of it. I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the uh, choir with the group who wants to come and listen to these types of uh, talks, but yeah, we're always looking for new people to participate in this. In this current project, we're, our goal is to expand it up the West Coast. So hopefully keep an eye out for what's going on with Bioscan uh, over the next few years. So this project wouldn't have been possible without a ton of help from a, a huge diversity of people. 
uh, Brian Brown, whose Believe You Missed project is up there in the top uh, left. He said, this is the only picture I can ever use of him. So there we go. Uh, next to him is Lisa Gonzalez, who is one of our, is just an absolutely fantastic um, taxonomist and entomologist and took most of the pictures you saw today. And so I just want to highlight those two people specifically. Beyond that, there's just a, a whole huge group of uh, researchers who were responsible for the, the projects that you've seen today. And with that, I will, I will go ahead and take any questions. Uh, I do encourage you to uh, look up a uh, bioscan at Na the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. And actually right now, all these pictures and a lot of others are on an online exhibit that we've created called Spiky, Hairy, Shiny, Insects of LA. Uh, I would definitely encourage people to swing by there and check it out. All right, I'll go ahead and quit sharing screen. Awesome, thank you so much, Max, that was awesome. Yeah. Um, very excited to hear that you are wanting to expand that up to the West Coast and hopefully yeah. maybe up here to Washington so that I can have one of these in my yard and then have a fly named after me. <laughs> yeah, that would be wonderful. <laughs> the next step is uh, to hopefully uh, launch it in three cities in California. Uh, th these kind of projects are expensive. They take time. Uh, but eventually the goal is to have this in cities all the way up the coast. Awesome. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and open up questions. Um, so if you are watching through Zoom, you can throw them in the Q&A box and I'll keep a track there. And then if you're watching through Facebook, you can also add questions in the comments section and I will kind of try to keep track of those as well. So um, I do have one question, Max, with the people that you were able to work with, um, with their yards, how did you start that conversation with them? Yeah, it's a great question. So coming from a museum, we have a base of donors as well as a base of members who come in and out. Uh, so we have kind of like a, a, a group of volunteers as well as other uh, immediate connections with the community. Uh, so we, we started off by leveraging that to reach out to people. And then from there, it, it worked often through word of mouth. We uh, heavily rely on, on uh, various apps like Nextdoor to reach out to people, as well as iNaturalist, which if you're not familiar with, is a, an, an, an amazing application uh, that is used to identify all sorts of different things. You can just take a picture of it and it'll tell you what it is. Uh, and then those pictures get uploaded and scientists can actually use them as data. So yeah, so mostly it was just grassroots, I guess. That's awesome. And then I know the poor flies don't get enough respect <laughs> out in the world for all that they do. Um, it's amazing that you're able to find um, 47 different new species through one research project. Um, did you see um, outside of the flies, did you find other um, orders of insects that were you're finding new species? Yeah, so... Um... The 47 new fly species are actually just within a single family. So flies okay. are, are an order. So there are several different families. So lots and lots and lots of different flies. Um, we partner up with uh, experts and taxonomists in different groups. Uh, currently, a lot of the tiny little wasps are being identified by a couple of other researchers. And we're likely to have come across at least two or three new species there. Um, the nice thing about insects is because there's so many of them, if you flip over enough rocks, you're likely to come across some new ones. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if down the line, this produces hundreds of new, new species that are entirely new to science. And for all we know, are only found in Los Angeles of all places. All right. Okay. So just another reminder, if you have any questions, go ahead and throw them in the questions sections. I am keeping track. And I'm on Facebook too, so you can ask there as well in the comments. Um, okay, so I did have another question for James that I thought of after the fact. Um, can you talk a little bit about the actual camera equipment that you use to get those types of shots of the up close for those tiny little guys? Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. sure. Um, I, uh, I, I used pre predominantly a, a zoom lens, a Sydney zoom, uh, which, had, which had a macro function on it. So um, uh, essentially to try and get the, the scale correct, which doesn't work all the time, but I think we get away with it. Um, we had to have um, a, a wide depth of field, which meant that um, everything would be in focus as much as possible. So um, I, at the time I was using, you know, uh, 
the best digital camera available at the time, which was a 35 millimeter format. Um, but they, uh, um, but one problem with that is that it, it, it highlights the shallow depth of field, which is inherent to that. So um, I had to sort of really over light everything, lots and lots of light mm. um, in order to, to then stop down on the lens, if that, if that makes sense to anyone who does photography, um, to try and <laughs> focus. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions coming in, um, which is cool, because I can ask you guys questions all day. <laughs> um, so, James, um, with the research that you've done showing that there is a relationship between native plants and uh, species diversity for insects, um, is there any work in progress to take it to um, the, the next level with the state or city to try to either create a program that increases awareness of that or helps people plant native plants? Yeah, I, so that would be an amazing thing to do. We're not quite at that stage. Uh, so one of the, uh, the, the scientific chatter would be that finding this out at, the at a single city is interesting, but we would call that an N of one. So we know it works in this one city. Does it work in the next city? Or is, is LA just weird? So our current project right now is to expand it to a couple other cities on the West Coast, specifically potentially uh, San Diego and San Francisco. And if we see the same sort of patterns where native plants tend to be really important, uh, then we would definitely start reaching out and going like, okay, this is a, this is a clear trend. Uh, this is something that we need to start encouraging people to do. There are researchers on the East Coast, uh, mostly based in the Maryland area, who've been doing similar work focusing on birds. And they have found similar sorts of trends, real strong importance of native plants. And thinking about, if not native, at least uh, climate appropriate, something that, that, that is similar to what should be there um, is really important for insect diversity, which becomes really important for like bird diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, long-term, that would definitely be the ideal. I, I am more of a uh, basic scientist is what we would call it, where I'm just focusing on the first research questions, but I would then kick it up to the next group of people and they would go, okay, here's how we figure out how to apply that. Uh, but it's not something we're currently working on, but it, it would be something in the works in the long run. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I like that you um, kind of define that as the basic scientist and like kicking it up to the next level. Um, Cause I, I think a lot of the fun stuff is like, what ifs, you know, like what, what's going on, what's going on with this. But then of course, um, you know, you need other people within other fields and having different um, backgrounds to be able to take it to that next level so that you can do things like implement um, you know policies or community programs to try to improve our environment around us so that we can support our native animals and plants um, so that, yeah that's cool yeah uh, definitely I would I would we actually have a, a community science group that that specializes in doing just that like how do we then talk to the people who live in these different areas and like figure out what they want and and make our science both helpful and um, appropriate and applied in a, in a, a reasonable way. Right. And uh, yeah, and it's actually, it's kind of ties into the overall um, discussion of what, why I wanted to do this art and science is that, you know, as at the Estuarium, what we do is help people connect with their environment. And we try to do that through as many different avenues as we can, which includes um, having scientists come in and talk about their research, but then also using art like James um, James's film to get people to connect on that level, because sometimes that's a little bit more accessible. Um, so yeah, so it's all about that community interaction between all of us to kind of understand what's happening around us so that we can make better choices in the future. Uh, so James, I do have another question for you. I asked you who your favorite insect was, um, who you, yeah. you would want to work with again. Who was your biggest diva? <laughs> who was the one you're like, never again, not on my set? <laughs> um, there's, there's an insect at the very beginning, which, um, which is not a wetter, but looks like one. I'm not sure what it is. Um, we had a whole scene lined up for him, but he kept on dying on us. So, uh, <laughs> so we wouldn't use him again. The, the, the beetle was quite biting. Um, and uh, we, we, we also had um, uh, the Natural History Museum in London um, gave us a, um, a, 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 
I was going to say a herd, <laughs> a colony, <laughs> a colony of, of, of uh, red army ants, um, and uh, we, we decided quite quickly to change um, the the horde at the end to cockroaches because they were rather bitey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they were rather difficult to work. Yeah. Yeah, no ants. <laughs> well, I'm actually an ant specialist. Like that is, oh, yeah. that is my focal insect, actually. So I, I completely understand. I don't film them. They're not worth it. It's so, so, so hard. So I, 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 I would have loved to have had them in. You know, I, I, in the script, it was it, it was ants. Um, on the second day, guy was trying to pull out a couple of them, and one was burrowing into his thumb, and we had to. Squeeze it out, and it, it it was rather awkward. <laughs> oh, that's awful. Mm. <laughs> uh, okay, I think on that note, <laughs> we'll probably call it a wrap for today. Um, again, I can't say thank you enough to both of you for being part of this and for replying to my random kind of crazy request. <laughs> um, I really appreciate it. It's been a lot, a lot of fun. Um, so again, I'm Reagan. I'm with the Puget Sound Estuarium here in Olympia, Washington. Um, we, of course, have been closed because of COVID-19, and we have been working hard to provide online opportunities for people to learn more. Uh, so please check in on our Facebook page or our website. Uh, we have a whole stream of education videos that are out there for people that are interested in learning more about estuaries or the Puget Sound area. Um, and you can always reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, yep, James and Max, thank you so much. Um, I hope you guys have a really good weekend and that your family and friends are all staying safe and healthy right now. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye everybody.